Thank you. Thank you. It is such a privilege and an honor to be here at Liberty University. You know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I remember Jerry Falwell, Dr. Jerry Falwell, and his great work with Moral Majority. And I was very involved in that movement to get Christians involved in the political arena. And so uh, I think it's very appropriate and uh, just that I would come here and speak on that very issue that was so dear to the heart of Dr. Falwell. So today I want to talk to you about what does the Bible say about why Christians need to be involved in the political arena. The Bible says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, when we are on the foundation of Jesus Christ, of course, the first thing that occurs is an intimate, personal relationship with the living God. Of course, that leads us to the Judeo-Christian ethic, where we start operating and living our lives on the fundamental basis of the Word of God. And of course, then the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, and we begin to shed that blood on others that fills us with the joy of doing what God has called us to do, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding fills our heart. Of course, that gives us also a purpose in life. We know what we're here for, and we begin to live a life of contribution, a life contributing to the life of others. And of course, we have the hope and the promise of eternal life. However, the Word of God says also, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The world has set other foundations. I want to talk to you very quickly about two of them. One is atheism, the other one is secular humanism. If we look at these foundations from two points of view, from the behavioral point of view, of course they lead about people being governed by their instincts. There is no moral absolute, and this leads us to situational ethics which unfortunately is being taught in pub private public schools all over America. This means that right and wrong is dependent upon the circumstances. Of course, without God, there is no value to life. That leads to immorality, that leads to sexual abuse, and there is no hope. They live without hope because there's nothing more. If we look at it more from a philosophical standpoint, these foundations of atheism and secular humanism believe that you are your own God. That leads us to something that unfortunately has crept into many churches across America, and it is what I call the social gospel. We have so many churches that are trying to become more like the world with the excuse of attracting the world. The problem is when the world comes, they don't find anything different. And the social gospel that could creep into something called liberation theology, which is a mixture of leftist pseudo-Christianity with Marxism. And that leads directly to a term that we are hearing all the time in the political arena, and that is social justice. It sounds very good because who would want social injustice? But let me tell you what social justice really is. Social justice is collectivism. Social justice is the rights of a group. It denies individual responsibility. It's a negation of individual responsibility, so social justice is totally contrary to the Word of God. That means that it also destroys self-reliance, and since they don't believe in God, Instead of relying on God, they rely on government. So it promotes a life of dependency, dependency upon government. And of course, that leads directly to socialism and ultimately to communism. Now, the unfortunate reaction of the church to these trends has been to become less and less relevant upon society and government, the opposite of what should have occurred. Now, I want to ask, why are we silent? Why is the church silent? Well, one of the excuses is separation of church and state. 
But let me tell you something. I've studied the Constitution. I've studied the Declaration of Independence. The word separation of church and state do not appear in either one of those two documents. The, the statement about separation of church and state comes from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association. The Danbury Baptist Association, and rightly so, was concerned about whether the government was going to impose a state religion upon, upon America, upon this newly formed country, because that's why they fled England, to come to a place where they could freely worship God. And in that letter, Thomas Jefferson said the following, believing with you that religion is a matter which lays solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that their leg leg legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So he very clearly says, matters of religion is between you and God, nobody else can interfere. And then he cites the First Amendment of the Constitution, which, which, which uh, talks about the free exercise of religion. And then he says, thus, or therefore, building a wall of separation between church, church and state. If you look at it in context, the wall is only a one-way wall. It's a wall to prevent government to impose a state religion. In no way, shape, or form is to prevent the citizenry to, to be an influence for righteousness upon society, upon government, upon every, every part of our nation. And that's where we have misunderstood this concept of separation of church and state. To give you an idea, did you know that before the Capitol was inaugurated, there were church services in the Capitol building in Washington? Thomas Jefferson, who wrote this letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, attended those services in the Capitol every Sunday as vice president and every Sunday as president, as did all other presidents up to and including Abraham Lincoln. Over 65 years, services were held in the Capitol building every Sunday with as many as 2,000 people. Does that sound like separation of church and state? Absolutely not. But let me tell you what that silence has done. 1963, prayer and Bible study were taken out of public school. And the church remained silent. Their excuse, it's a political issue. The consequence, teen pregnancy skyrocketed. Immorality skyrocketed. Ungodliness skyrocketed. 1973, the Supreme Court decided that unborn babies had no civil rights and legalized abortion. And the church remained silent. Their excuse, it's a political issue. The consequence, 55 million babies have been murdered in America in the last, since Roe v. Wade was passed. And my question is, how long will we remain silent? And is God going to judge our silence? The excuse, the other excuse we hear is, God just called me to preach the gospel. It sounds so pious. And my answer, my question to those people that tell me, God just called me to preach the gospel is, what is the gospel? The gospel is a lot more than John 3.16. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20, my hands are free from the blood of all men because I have not shown to declare the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the last verse of Revelation. And you know, that reference about my hands are free from the blood of all men, Paul was referring to Ezekiel 3.18 and 19. In Ezekiel 3.18, God says, uh, if you do not warn the wicked of his wicked ways 
and he does not turn from his wickedness, he will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require of your hands. Pretty heavy, isn't it? And then in Ezekiel 319, it says, but if you warn the wicked of his wicked ways, and he does not turn from it, he still will die in his iniquity, but you have redeemed your soul. Our responsibility is to warn the wicked. How the wicked responds, that's between that person and God. Now, you know, Jesus also said, you're the light of the world. But you know, we go to church with our little flashlights and we point the light on one another. But you know, light is worthless unless you point it on darkness. That is out there in the world. Jesus also said, you're the salt of the earth. Salt is a preserver. But for salt to preserve anything, you have to, have to put it upon that which you want to preserve. Again, that's out there outside the four walls of the church. Earlier this year, the Lord told me in no uncertain terms, the church is responsible for the ungodliness in America today. And the Lord led me to a scripture in Ezekiel 3.17. And Ezekiel 3.17 says, Son of man, I call you as a watchman on the wall, basically to do two things, to hear from me, that is to hear from God, and number two, to warn the people. Warn the people. Are we warning the people? The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just, both are an abomination to the Lord. And my question is, are we justifying the wicked actions of government by remaining silent? Someone said once, silent is consent. Proverbs 29 and 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. Have we been encouraging other Christians to vote for righteous leaders? Now, let me ask you something. Did you know that the Bible tells you exactly who to vote for? I'm going to show you how the Bible tells you who to vote for. Let's look at Exodus 18.21. Exodus 18.21. Now let me put it in context. Moses has just come across the Red Sea. He's trying to govern about a million people. And he's going bananas. And here comes his father-in-law, Jethro. And Jethro, God speaks through Jethro and says to Moses, Moses, what you're doing is not good. And then he says, you select from among the people. Now note, God doesn't say, I will appoint. God says, select from among the people. Select is the same as elect. And then he gives four qualifications of the people you should elect. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. What are those four? Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Now let me define the last one. In Washington, covetousness is not primarily about money. It's primarily about power and control. They become drunk with power. And let's go to the New Testament. New Testament, Acts 6, 3. Again, they're ready to have the first deacons. Again, God doesn't say, I will appoint deacons. It says, you select from among the people. And now it gives three qualifications. Number one, men of good reputation. That's the same of men of truth. Number two, such as fear God. That's the same of, I mean, full of the Holy Spirit, which is the same as such as fear God. And number three, 
full of wisdom, which is the same as able men. So uh, there are the same qualifications in both the Old and the New Testament. So let's go back to Exodus 18, 21 again. It says four qualifications. Remember them well because you can vet any candidate with these four qualifications. What are they? Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. And then it says, and appoint them as rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. And in the next scripture, in verse 22, it says, then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you to Moses, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. Do you know what that's describing? First of all, it's describing federal government, state government, county government, local government. And then it says, you only take up to Moses, to the federal government, matters of great importance. Everything else you handle at the local level. You know what that is? That's Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, enumeration of powers. Anything not in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, the federal government's got no business being involved in. It should be handled at the local level. So that is Article 1, Section 8, and the 9th and 10th Amendment, all encompassed in just two verses of Scripture. Now, if we look at Acts 6.3, we could say, all right, they were electing the first deacons. What was the purpose of electing the first deacons? It tells you that it was to serve tables. You know what that was? To feed the poor. Feeding the poor was the responsibility of the church, according to Scripture, not the responsibility of the government. But we have abdicated our responsibility. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says that caring for the widows and the orphans was, first of all, the responsibility of the individual if he could do it within his family. And if not, it was the responsibility of the church. That is welfare. Welfare was to be biblically the responsibility of the church, not the responsibility of government. But again, we abdicated our responsibility. Now, let's look at our historical significance. Because this being divorced from what's happening in society, from what happened in government, is not our heritage. You gotta realize this. The, you know that if I look at the Declaration of Independence, and I look at the Constitution of the United States of America, I believe that those two documents are the two greatest documents that have ever been written outside of the Bible. And the reason is those two documents were written on the knees of the framers. These were men of God that were seeking revelation from above. And I am convinced that both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States are divine revelation from God. Did you know that every one of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence were preached from the pulpits of America before they were written on the Declaration? As a matter of fact, someone had said the Declaration of Independence is nothing more than a series of sermon summaries. It was men of God, they were pastors, the ones that were at the forefront of our war of independence. Many of these pastors were called preacher patriots. The British used to call them the Black Robe Brigade because many of these pastors wore long black robes. Many of them had the Continental Army uniform underneath the black robe. They would preach in church on Sunday, and then they would take their robe and with half their congregation go fight for our independence. As a matter of fact, did you know or do you know where Paul Revere was going when he was crying out, the British are coming? He was going to the home of a pastor. He was going to the home of a pastor by the name of Jonas Clark. 
Jonas Clark was one of these black robe regiments. In his house were two of the patriots, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. Pastor Jonas Clark was probably one of the most feared men by the British Army because he recruited more people to fight for our independence than almost anybody else in the War of Independence. And my question is, where are those pastors today? Did you know that 29 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were seminary graduates? They were theologians. They were men of God. They were people deeply committed to establishing the Word of God in the hearts and minds of our people. You know, a few years ago, during Nazi Germany, there was a pastor by the name of Martin Neumuller. And Pastor Neumuller said, first they came for the socialist. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Pastor Neumuller died in prison. Again, the question is, how long will we remain silent? You know, I, I came across not too long ago a poll that really, really broke my heart. And this poll says that in the United States of America, there are somewhere between 65 to 80 million evangelical Christians. And the way they define evangelical Christians was people that go to church, that pray, and read the Word of God. So this was not including people that say, of course I'm a, I'm a Christian, I was born in America. 65 to 80 million evangelical Christians in this country. But here is the sad news. Only 50% of those are registered to vote. That is almost 30 to 40 million Americans, not Christians, not registered to vote. And of the ones that are registered to vote, only 50% voted in the last election. That means somewhere between 45 to 60 million Christians didn't even vote. We get what we deserve. God has called us to be salt and light, and we have to stop hiding inside the four walls of the church. For those of you who are pastors or will be pastors, you need to stop hiding behind the pulpit. We have been called to make a difference. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to proclaim His Word, the whole counsel of God, and shout it from the house top. We have a responsibility to elect righteous leaders. You know, we have a clear way from Scripture to vet these righteous leaders. Do you remember those four qualifications? Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. You can expand such as fear God, saying, if you fear God, you're going to obey the Word of God. That means you are going to abide by a Judeo-Christian ethics of not only worship and honoring God and His commands, but you're going to live a life of integrity, according to very clearly stated in Psalms 15, a life of honesty. You're going to be defending life at all stages because the Word of God is very clear about the sanctity of life you are going to be looking for limited government because more government is more control. You know, what the framers did was something so revolutionary. Because before the framers, every government in the world was a top-down government. You had a tyrant or a monarch ruling everybody, and the people were all serfs of the government. 
These framers turned this system right side up and it became a bottom up system where, you know, you look at the Constitution of the United States. It is not coincidental that the first three words in the Constitution are in huge letters and they say, we the people. We the people are to govern. That is that bottom up system. And then in the Declaration of Independence, in the Declaration of Independence, in the, in the preamble, we read, we hold this truth to be self-evident. Well, unfortunately, they're not too self-evident to many of those clowns in Washington. And then it says that all men are created equal. The problem with Washington is that some are more equal than others. And we see favoritism being played, and we see handouts being given in repayment for political favors. And then it says that they are endowed, and what are the next three words? By their creator, with certain unalienable rights. You know, the only thing that makes those rights unalienable is if they come from God. Because if they come from government, government can take them away. Let me tell you something about my experience in Cuba. When Castro took over, soldiers would come into a kindergarten class and would say to, a kid, to the kids, all right, kids, close your eyes and pray to God for candy. Come on, come on, come on. Where is the candy? No candy. Okay, close your eyes again and pray to Fidel for candy. And then very quietly, they would put candy on the desk of all the kids. You see, socialism requires that government becomes your God. That's why they attack on religion. It's not really the end, the attack on religion. That's the means to making government your God. The declaration continues that those rights are the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then it says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. To secure those rights, not to trample upon those rights. And then it continues saying, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Who are the governed? We are the governed. It's all right if you respond. We are the governed. And there are a lot of things that are being done by government that we never gave them our consent. But you know, then there's another expression right after that. It says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. And we have an opportunity to do that through the ballot box. So God is saying to you, vote for righteous people. Vote for people that honor God and honor his word. You cannot say politics is a dirty business, I don't want any part of it. Remember Proverbs 29 and 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. I want to close with the last few words of the Declaration of Independence, where it says, relying upon the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred government. I want to ask all of you to stand, please. Please stand and face one another in pairs. I want us to finish with a covenant. You come do it with me. We're going to finish with a covenant. I am going to repeat this pledge. I want you to repeat it from the heart, relying upon the protection of divine providence. Relying upon the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes and our sacred honor to do all we can to restore righteousness to America, to do all we can to establish the kingdom of God.
So help me God. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Bless you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much.